it's a pleasure to be here. So it's a pleasure to be here and share some of the work that we are doing with you. Um, so the title of the talk is um, up here. I don't read it to you. I'm, I'm really trying to make a case for, um, for uh, coastal land and coastal land elevation uh, um, for, for it being an important player in the climate system and uh, which uh, can undergo rapid changes. And some of those changes would impact uh, society and economy in an in a adverse way. So let me explain uh, first uh, to those of you who may not be familiar with the tipping points, what is really climate tipping point? So there are many definitions in literature started probably for the past two decades at this, as I tracked the literature. Uh, got received lots of attention and also in IPCC report, a recent one, I think it's included in a, a great uh, detail. So a climate tipping point occurs when an abrupt change in the system is triggered by slight change in one of or group of the forcings. So there are many different kinds of transition um, from that at this tipping point, again, discussed in literature. Two of them I show here following the work of the 2011, so bifurcation and also noise induced trans, uh, transition. So um, the, the horizontal axis is the control parameter and the vertical axis is the state of the system. So system has its own variation, but it may reach a point that is shown here that is very close to the stage that if there is a slight change in one of the parameters, instead of following its usual path, it would undergo a rapid uh, change that uh, would result into consequences that are not um, easy to, to adapt to and also to uh, create, uh, to, to manage in a, in a way that um, society and economy is, uh, is not impacted and environment is not impacted in adverse way. So, and um, in a climate system, so far, uh, you know, in the, in the climate system, every component that has a tipping point called tipping element. So currently there are uh, three group of um, uh, tipping elements recognized in cryosphere, atmosphere and biosphere, which have relevance for uh, policy making. And that means this tipping point and tipping, um, this element has a tipping point that may reach within 21st century, which make them relevant for the policymakers and the managers to create resiliency plans and uh, adaptation strategies. So here is the argument for the coastal land. So I put up forward the proposition. So, you know, coastal land shown with sigma is a tipping element if and only if a parameter rho with a critical value rho critic can be defined such that system fe fe feature f, which is a projection of the uh, sigma qualitatively or quantitatively depends on whether rho can exceed it, can, be ex can exceed rho critic by some amount delta rho for the, at least time t of. So this is a proposition. For this proposition to be true, rho and um, also um, rho critic must be defined carefully. So if you define the rho as a coastal land elevation and the rho critic as a sea level height, and if to be flooding on land, flooding and inundation, this proposition holds, meaning that coastal land would be uh, qualified for a tipping element. And it will have also a tipping point that I would discuss in a uh, later slide. So the consequence of coastal land passing that tipping element, tipping point is, um, exacerbated flooding and inundation hazard that would impact um, large part of the coast and probably the population. So that's important because here I show you the coastal land elevation. Majority of the coastal land elevations are very low, specifically if you pay attention here in the east part of the United States, Gulf Coast and also South Asia, the elevation is less than three meters for most part of the coast. And if you look at the rate of sea level rise, similar area actually are undergoing rapid sea level rise of uh, two to five millimeter or even up to 10 millimeter per year. And again, if you look at the projection of the population that lives along the coast uh, under different SSP scenarios, you see that under most cases, we will expect a large 
coastal migration and increase in the population. Putting all these uh, figures together, qualitatively, you can conclude that if, if and only if the coastal land is a tipping element and has a tipping point that result into the exacerbated inundation and flooding hazard, a large part of the, this population will be exposed to significant amount of flooding and um, uh, possibly inundation, which has the consequences that um, uh, can be discussed under the you know, adaptation uh, strategies and so on. So the outstanding challenge at the moment is uh, create models that are physics-based or AI-based or a combination of the two that captures physical, chemical, biological, and other processes to characterize tipping points and identify causal, causal factors with sufficient computational efficiency needed to explore decadal scale effects. This is, this is, this is an ongoing um, and outstanding challenge. And I believe there, there will be, uh, there, there should be significantly more attention to this point because again, as I emphasized, uh, at, as I tried to make the case in the previous slides, uh, once the coastal land, specifically coastal land, passes that tipping point, it would trigger significant uh, socioeconomic impacts, adverse socioeconomic impact that will um, have uh, global consequences. So, and we, we know very little about uh, this tipping point at this moment and how, what factors determines them and um, when and where they would happen and what would be the consequence of that tipping uh, point being passed. So in the proposition that I put forward, I had a delta rho with a small change in state system, a state of the system, and that would trigger uh, that um, uh, you know, uh, tipping point. And here I would like to point out what that delta rho is. So I argue that delta rho, that small change or that tiny change in the system actually is a vertical land motion that uh, here is manifested or shown around the uh, coast of the uh, global coast by using available GNSS networks that each circle is color coded to the rate of vertical land motion measured by GNSS uh, station at that location. And comparing this map with the previous maps, again, you see that many areas that are, are undergoing um, rapid sea level rise and are low elevation and have large population also have rapid land subsidence. So this is, this is alarming. So it suggests that where we have the most risk, actually it's more likely that the tipping point um, passes and uh, a chain of um, uh, adverse effects uh, triggers. So what drive the land subsidence? I want to drill down a little bit into the processes that drive, that, that help us to understand really what factors really determine that tipping elements of the uh, coastal land and uh, what factor would uh, help that or cause that um, tipping element to reach and pass its tipping point. So this is a cross section that goes through the Northern America from the Western part, which is Cascadia, through eastern part, which is basically where you guys are. Um, so starting from the west, one of the main factors and drivers of the coastal land subsidence is the tectonic processes. So specifically here, the Pacific plate is uh, sub, um, subducting under the North American plate. And as, as a result of this um, subduction, the overriding plate is thickening and uplift happens. So in some area in Cascadia, we have uplift rate of up to a um, few millimeter at the moment. But in the time of the next big earthquake, which is likely to happen in this century, the overriding plate will stretch. And as a result of that, we expect uh, tens of centimeters to meters of subsidence happening along the coast. And that would exacerbate, that would result into the sudden increase in the relative sea level rise, which would um, uh, exacerbate the impact of flooding and also the tsunami that may happen due to this event, which qualify as a, a tipping point indeed. So then the other process is a box number two that impact the vertical land motion along the coast is the compaction of the aquifers and reservoirs due to extraction of the fluid, whether it is water or is oil and gas, 
This process can be extremely nonlinear in time and space, but the effect is very localized compared to the previous uh, case that uh, process or example that we saw. And again, this can qualify for a tipping point. For instance, think about um, the rising, um, the, the, the time that, for example, we have a storm approaching a coast, and at the same time, there has been a drought in the region and people pumped a lot of water from the aquifers that causes significant subsidence at a short period of time. And that storm surge coming through with that exacerbated land subsidence would result into widespread subs uh, flooding that may not have been uh, the case if that aquifer would not have been depleted. So the other process is box number three that result into the, uh, it's a, um, vertical land motion due to uh, GIA effect, which is um, fairly steady in 21st century. The area that is uh, um, uh, area of the uh, past or last uh, major ice age, uh, ice sheet in North America is uplifting at the rate of about one centimeter per year. And the perimeter of that is subsiding at the rate of about two millimeter per year. And uh, otherwise, in most places, except Antarctica and uh, Greenland and, uh, sorry, and uh, Alaska that are losing mass right now, in most of the most other places, the least rate is steady to in 21st century. We don't expect major changes in it. The last process, box number four, is the compaction of the sediments um, due to the, under their own weight. And this process can be linear in time, but can be uh, significantly heterogeneous in space. And also uh, human activity, for example, creating dams and, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, manipulating the supply of the sediment to basin um, over the time can result into the significant nonlinear uh, nonlinearity in the rate of the sediment compaction which also can result, can exacerbate flooding hazard and um, also can uh, constitute a, a parameters that lead the coastal land toward a steeping point. So putting all these processes together and um, here the graph in horizontal axis I show the substance rate and vertical is the um, uh, time scale of each operation or is pro each process. And for your reference in the middle, I put the rate of the sea level rise and its projection. So it's projected to be about 10 millimeter per year by end of 21st century, if we don't do anything about the climate change. Anything to the right, which is um, fluid extraction and sediment compaction seem to be more relevant for policy, policy making in terms of rates and a special extent than the sea level rise. So for the fluid extraction and sediment compaction in most places, until mid of this century, at least 2050, 2060, has a rate that um, surpasses the rate of the sea level rise and for policy making probably is more relevant than um, sea level rise itself. And anything that is to the left that you see here up and um, here, they, they are probably not as relevant during the 21st century as uh, sea level rise itself. But in long run, uh, if you look at beyond 21st century, probably they become more relevant and important. So to monitor the land subsidence at the global scale and at the low cost. Um, I, 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 I mean, so, sorry okay. to interrupt you. And um, we've got a, a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, a question oh, please. from, from yes. uh, Christopher. Um, what are the spatial scales associated with the processes uh, that you are identifying uh, previously in, in your previous slide? Oh, let me go back to the previous slide then. So you're talking about this slide, uh, the first slide that I put different processes, correct? Chris? Uh, more, uh, well, it could be this one, but I was actually referring to the, to the next slide that was titled substance. Oh. Yeah, so wondering if okay. there's an equivalent slide with uh, spatial scales on it. Oh, that, that's a good question. I can create that, but unfortunately I don't have it here. I can tell you that, for example, the tectonic processes have a time, the spatial scale of uh, hundreds to thousands of kilometers, 100 to several hundred kilometers. Uh, lithospheric sediment loading, um, it's, it, it, I, I can give you a correct good number for that. I have a few studies from Bangladesh. It's at the order of several hundred kilometers. GI probably is the well known, I mean, the scale is probably global. Uh, fluid extraction can be at the order of tens of kilometers to several tens of kilometers, less than hundred. 
And sediment compaction is some, something between 100 and 500 kilometers, depending on the size of the basin that I can rule up. Thank you very much. And, yes. and uh, we have another comment. Uh, we have a comment from Gavin. Um, Gavin is suggesting the, a technical point, perhaps the, uh, around the, the definition of a, a tipping point, suggesting that perhaps uh, what, what, what is discussed here is more in line with a, a threshold than the technical definition of a tipping point. Um, where tipping point typically implies some sort of uh, multiple equilibria and hysteresis, as opposed to, um, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, hysteresis and, and uh, multiple equilibria are not uh, well evidenced in, in, in coastal flooding problems. Okay, um, that's a good point. Um... I, I'm happy to discuss that in, in further lengths. I don't have any arguments against the, the, the notion, this comments, but I, I can also uh, justify why I, I prefer the tipping points, but um, I, I would probably get back to that at the end of the talk. Okay, thank you. So, um, as I mentioned, the, the, the satellites seem to be a really a reasonable uh, way to go to get the, this measurement at the large scale, uh, high resolution and low cost. So I use in my lab radar remote sensing, which is active imaging technique. You know, radar satellites transmit this uh, microwave signal, propagate through the clouds and vegetation hit the ground and comes back to the satellite, collect the backscatter. By using this data, we can create all different kinds of map, you know, the map of the biosphere and, you know, study the geohazards. And uh, also we can, um, you know, help with the safety of the maritime and, you know, by detecting iceberg and so on and many, many other applications. So currently the, 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 the whole journey started probably in 1990 for the civil applications with ERS-1 satellites launched in 1990. And um, currently we have a whole bunch of satellites operating at different wavelengths by different agencies. And among those, I would like to point out Sentinel-1A has an open data policy with the minimum latency. So everybody around the world can access this data and do all the cool science with that. And data quality is amazing. And hopefully NISAR, which will launch in a day, year or two, will follow similar uh, policy, which would revolutionize the way that um, Air observation is done. In addition to that, you know, private sector has been very active. Since 2017, there has been tens of uh, satellites, SAR satellite launched by private sector, and it's expected that the market grow to almost $10 billion within the next few years. And uh, we have abundance of this data, and the point, question is not really if we have the data, the, the bigger question is how to handle this vast amount of data that flows in. So the journey started almost, to, uh, as I said, three decades ago. The first geophysical application of the INSAR probably was mapping the, the formation of the Landers earthquake. As you see here, made it to the nature of the, uh, made it to the cover of the Nature magazine. And since then, um, things evolved quite a lot. So in the next few slides, up through a cartoonish presentation, I'll show you how INSAR works. So think about this island, Hawaii Island, has two uh, active volcanoes, Mauna Loa and Kilauea. Radar satellite overflies, transmit the radar signal, collect the back scatter, and then comes back and after um, several days, weeks, or months, transmit the same signal at the location which is close to the first one and acquire the, um, you know, collect the return signal and create the second image. So. But after co-registering the second one with the first, we multiply the first one with the complex, complex conjugate of the second one, and we create an interferogram. So this interferogram mostly includes the deformation of the ground, effect of the topography, and any other um, impact that we have from the atmospheric error and so on. So we are interested in deformation. So we take a digital elevation model existing DEM, such as a SARTM dam, we subtract it from our interferogram and we create this differential interferogram, which mostly include the effect of the surface deformation. As you see here is the Mauna Loa volcano and this is Kilauea volcano. And I want to uh, remind you that this is a radar coordinate, it's not geographic, so that's why Kilauea is not here and here and things a little bit rotated. 
And the deformation that you measure here is in the line of sight. So it's toward the satellite or away from the satellite. So, and also we have some other signal here that you can see it. Clearly they are not associated with any change in the deformation, but are mostly due to the change in the properties of the atmosphere during the two acquisitions. So that's the next big thing that happened. So combining many, many acquisitions that, that occurred at the same area at, the, at different time and create time series. And through that increased redundancy in time and space to reduce the artifacts and create the formation map at the very high resolution and accuracy. There has been lots of effort along, um, uh, along that line since 2001. So to create uh, algorithm for the insert time series generation. And one of those uh, recent one is the work that we did in my lab and we maintained that. I don't go into detail of it, but the approach uses uh, heavily relies on the wavelet theory, which take the stack of data sets that we have, we send them into a wavelet transformation, 3D wavelets. You break it apart and then based on statistical properties of each part, we apply some uh, sort of filtering bandpass filter to remove different errors that you see here. And then we apply inverse wavelet transform to create a high resolution digital uh, vertical land motion, which is suitable for most applications. So we have one challenge here. <clears throat> One of the big challenge when you want to use vertical land motion or measurements for studying coast is that um, the observation along the coast must be extensive because coasts are extensive. We need hundreds to thousands of kilometers uh, coverage, but at the same time, we need high resolution to be able to be relevant for management purposes. So these challenges provide us with opportunity to work with, uh, bring two communities together. So GNSS community and INSAR community. Because in GNSS measurements are long-term and the 3D vector or 3D displacement field, while the INSAR measurements are especially extensive, but um, um, they, they are in the local reference frame. Combining these two data set provides us with observation that answers those needs and those challenges. So here's some take-home lessons. Land subsidence exacerbates the hazard and risk associated with sea level rise. There are several natural anthropogenic factors that drive land subsidence. So INSAR GNS, uh, GNSS combination enab enables measuring the contemporary rate of subsidence at management relevant resolution. Some application, the first application is from the California so it's about 1,500 uh, kilometer coast of California, very well instrumented because of the you know, primary uh, interest in earthquakes and faulting processes, which we benefited in this study. So there are lots of uh, satellite data, this is squares or rectangles, are footprint of different satellites. Triangles are different um, uh, location of the GNSS stations. So combination of all these data sets uh, give us um, robust estimate of the vertical land motion over the course of almost um, 10 years, from 2007 through 2019. So here I show you the final results, which is the vertical land motion. So the, the negative uh, or blue signal is, uh, blue color indicates subsidence, and the red or warmer color is up. So you can see the Southern California is mostly subsiding, and the center part also undergoes subsidence. And we have uh, some uplift in north, which is the uplift due to Cascadia. And we have some isolated uplift signal, which are aquifers, uh, Santa Ana, Santa Clara, and Livermore that are rebounding due to the water management activities that started after the 2015 drought. Comparing this data with independent GPS measurement, these GPS data were not used in our analysis. They kept aside for validation. Each circle represents represent two values. So the rim is the INSAR measurement and the, the, the field color is what GNSS measured. So if you cannot distinguish rim from the field color means that the two data sets match very well. And if you can distinguish, that means there are some differences. Examining some of these stations, for example, I want to highlight um, this one here. This example that you see slight difference between the two measurements we found out that the reason for that difference is that the GNSS station and INSAR measurements were not aligned in time. So they did not have overlapping observation period. And we, if we compare only stations that had overlapping observation, we get um, a standard deviation of the difference, which is better than one millimeter per year. 
Using this data, we can do lots of cool things. One of those interesting studies is the exposure analysis. How many people are exposed to vertical land motion, oh, sorry, subsidence faster than one millimeter per year? So not to surprise, majority of that population that's exposed to subsidence located in the Southern California, but also in San Francisco uh, Bay. We estimated several million people are subject uh, or exposed to subsidence faster than one millimeter per year. So here are some take home messages. The combination of the multi-track INSAR and GENIUS uh, data enables measuring vertical land motion thousands of kilometer and 50 meter resolution. We created the first VLM map at, in the global reference frame for the entire coast of California. And we estimated 4.3 to 8.7 million people are likely to be exposed to that subsidence. And the last point is extremely important. I want to highlight that. SAR data with global coverage are publicly available and the technology is available to do the computation and create a vertical land motion for entire world coast. However, it hasn't been done and it requires support from the private and public funding agency to make it happen, to assess this, to carefully assess this, this risk and the hazard associated with the vertical land motion. In the next slide, I want to highlight more the importance of the vertical land motion when it comes to assessment of the future hazard, uh, flooding hazard. So for zooming into the San Francisco Bay area, you see that some areas are subsiding at a faster rate of four millimeter or faster than that. So it's the San Francisco Bay, uh, San Francisco International Airport, um, Foster City, you know, part of this Treasure Island and some other area. For the San Francisco Bay, we have also projection of the sea level rise through different scenarios. As you see here, this is a published work in 2017. And through the IPCC report, we have more recent measurement that we're gonna use in our future study to update our measurements and maps. So the question is how we can combine this contemporary rate of vertical land motion with this projection of the uh, sea level rise. So this is a challenge that hasn't been addressed yet, uh, yet and it's subject of the ongoing research. Currently, vertical land motion are projected linearly forward, which in some places might or might not be good. So for, Centra, for San Francisco Bay Area, majority of these subsidence and uplift that you see, a uh, subsidence, sorry, is uh, associated with compaction of the sediment. So we can create a physics-based model that relate the age of the sediment to the thickness of the sediment vertical axis and estimate the expected rate of the subsidence that you, you would consider for different thickness and different age. And you see the rate is not linear, but we, we concluded that in the area that we have the Holocen Bay mod, compaction rate can be considered sublinear, but in area that we have the landfill, such as Foster City here, if we assume the rate is linear, we may undergo, we encounter up to 15% error in future projection of the vertical land motion. But then we learned that given the error that we have in other parameters of the vertical land motion or the system, such as um, uh, high resolution LIDAR dam that we use, probably 15% error is negligible. So for simplicity, we used linear extrapolation and we extrapolated this contemporary rate of the subsidence into future uh, linearly and um, consider the error that we under encounter is negligible. So we tested many different scenario of the sea level rise projections and uh, subsidence here. I'll show you just one example this is the RCP 8.5, which is at the time considered about 1.2 meters of this uh, sea level rise by end of 21st century for the Bay Area. And uh, we estimated uh, area that is going to be flooded only due to the sea level rise shown in yellow, and area that is going to be flooded due to the sea level rise and land substance shown in red. We concluded that about 168 square kilometer will be inundated due to only sea level rise. And if we include the land substance to that, the number will be 218 uh, square kilometer. Uh, moving now to the Texas, Houston, Texas. Uh, we have similar problem there, and we try to investigate the impact of the sea level rise as well as land subsidence and storm surges on the flooding. So specifically after the Harvey hurricane in 2017, it seems that the effect of the storm surges um, is an important uh, pro parameter that has to be accounted for when assessing the future flooding hazard. 
So in the area, we have bills of data, different uh, satellites, and also GNSS measurements. And also we have a very good LiDAR DM. Um, left is the data set. And to the right, I'll show you just the vertical land motion in the region. It's obtained as a combination of all that data sets. Most area around the Houston Bay uh, is subsiding at rate of about two to five millimeter per year. So we did a test here. We assume that somehow magically we stop the sea level rise in the region and see which area is going to be subsided only due to the land subsidence. We estimated that something about 70 square kilometer land will be subsided at, until end of 21st century. And here the color shows different uh, uh, inundation area at different time through 21st century, 2030, 50, and 100. 2030 and 50 are more relevant for policymaking, so that's why we create them. So now look at the worst scenario. In that case, by end of 21st century, we want to see how much land we, will be flooded if we have sea level rise under, under the RCP 8.5 scenario, subsidence, and eight meter of the storm surge. You see that large part of the Galveston Bay and also Houston City will be flooded under this um, very extreme uh, scenario, which seemed not to be unlikely given the latest report. So some take home messages, even without any future global sea level rise, a flooding hazard may increase due to um, continued coastal uh, land substance. So in San Francisco Bay area, an area of 125 square kilometer and 429 square kilometer will be subject to inundation. Due to, to, due to sea level rise and land substance by end of the century. And also in Houston Bay, an area of 186 to 1,157 square kilometer will be subject, subject to inundation, flooding, uh, and flooding due to different processes, including sea level rise, land substance, and storm surge given different scenarios. So I just want to close. Oh, the, oh, there is a question here. Let me, I try to read that. What is the global mean sea level rise or original sea level um, for those scenarios? Oh, we tested many different scenarios. So in San Francisco Bay is about um, uh, uh, 1.2 meters. So basically between 90 centimeter and 1.4 uh, meter. And in Houston Bay, I don't remember the number top of my head is very close, but I can look it up shortly and I give you an exact answer. It's about the same range. So, and, and also in the paper, we have a table that we tested all different scenarios. I can share that as well. So ongoing project, this is a new project that's uh, funded by USGS and it's a close, close co collaboration with USGS to create and update um, national flood hazard maps by accounting all different processes, sea level rise, coastal erosion, vertical land motion, you know, the best and greatest uh, projection of the sea level rise and so on. So I just show you some of the results from uh, East Coast of United States. So we combined all the available data. So we have Sentinel and ALOS along the coast of United States. It's a hundreds of terabytes of data. And also we have um, lots of GNSS stations. To the right, right panel, you see the uh, uh, spatial distribution of the, the, the different data sets. So blue is the Sentinel and red is the ALOS pixels. The processing and analysis is done for the area that these two data sets overlap. So here are the final results. So the, what you see here is the east, east, west, up, up, down, or south, north, sorry, north and south and up down components of the um, 3D displacement field as a combination of all those data sets. And the circles show location of GNSS stations that are not used for the analysis and are kept aside for validation. And the histogram shows you the, the comparison between different data sets. So just I so focus on the last one, which is vertical land motion. You see that we, we obtain about a, a standard deviation of the difference between data two data set, which is about 1.2 millimeter per year for nearly 3,000 kilometer coast of the um, United States, uh, so east coast of the United States. And as you see, the fastest uh, substance rate of up to six, six millimeter per year happened in Chesapeake Bay area. 
And also here in the South Carolina and Georgia area, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, subsidence, uh, fast um, subsidence, which is uh, way faster than rate of sea level rise in the region. So with these data sets, we can estimate the exposure. You know, in the left, we have the land use, uh, land cover data for United States produced by USGS. It's a race, recent one, I believe, 2019. And we estimated which area and which component is mostly exposed to substance. So not a surprise, wetlands are the one that is mostly affected by the land subsidence, but also urban area and also forests and also the, the farmlands are the next one that are impacted along the East Coast of United States. And this is very important because whether or not these um, sediments are subsiding due to addition of the sediments or due to the erosional process, that has significant implication for their capacity in maintaining the CO2 and uh, which, uh, which is the greenhouse gas. And if the land, if this um, land subsidence is correlating or related to the uh, loss of the land um, due to different processes, it means that that CO2 will be released to the atmosphere and uh, may accelerate actually the rate of the uh, uh, warming. And this is a part hasn't been studied really well, and it's a subject of ongoing research in East Coast of the United States, but extremely important topic. So let's zoom into the New York area. I think that's where most of you are located. So we have quite a bit of subsidence here in this region. Some of this is due to the GIA effect, but when we, in, we it's an ongoing study, but we realized that not all of this can be explained to GIS. So some of that is localized effect, whether it's the weight of the building or some other localized activity, such as groundwater pumping, this yet to be determined. And again, for the area, we, we estimated the exposure. So again, forests have the most exposure, but also wetland and uh, you know, developed land cities also are subject of the um, land substance. About 10 million people we estimated that are exposed to this subsidence. Further south, Chesapeake Bay, that has the fastest rate of the subsidence. Also, the majority of the exposure is to wetlands, uh, some of the forest and also um, uh, farmland has, um, are exposed. And again, the main cause of the vertical land motion here or subsidence is under debate, whether it is a compaction of the sediment or is a groundwater extraction or a combination of the two yet to be determined. Further south in uh, South Carolina and Georgia area, this is Savannah. So majority of the substance, as you see here, which is up to six millimeter per year, is at the location of the uh, wetlands and area that is um, um, undergoing this substance. Again, we have to determine whether the substance is due to the addition of the sediment, which causes the, you know, add loads on top and uh, causes the land to subside or is due to erosional processes. So answering this question has big uh, implication for the contribution of this wetland in restoring or releasing the CO2. But well, thank you so much. And if there is any question, I would be happy to answer. Thanks very much, Manu, uh, for a fascinating talk. Um, do we, do we have any uh, questions from anyone? Um, yeah, I'll, um, so the question, um, one question is, is how do you account for uh, sedimentation, which is, would then counter the, the, the subsidence by increasing the elevation? Right, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, first of all, I want to emphasize that sediment, addition of the sediment actually does not directly translate into increasing the elevation. Because when you add the sediment, you add a load on top of the sediment. So I think the process starts with sort of subsidence and we need a, a specific rate for the sedimentation to, um, to offset that substance and begin um, increasing the land or gaining the land. At this moment, we don't account for that. This is just pure observation, but this is an ongoing research that we created a mechanical model that the output input to that model is the thickness of the sediment, initial thickness, and also the rate that sediment will be added on, on top. And then we calculate um, how much of that sediment addition would translate into land gain or elevation gain, and how much of that will actually 
result in substance. I can answer that better maybe in a couple of months from now <laughs> when we have the model result. And, and the other thing is, is one of the things we've been seeing is that, you know, for instance, the GPS and, and other things are, are rooted on, you know, we often use buildings or, or, or things. And so they're often not capturing the very shallow Excellent. subsidence. And we actually see that there's quite a lot of subsidence or compaction going on in the upper few meters that's not captured. You know, so exactly, that was perfect. That's a very good point. That was our experience because inside measures what is really on the top. So, but often GPS stations are anchored to several meters depths below the surface. Right. So we are uh, ac accounting for that difference by installing new instruments. It's a very simple instrument called RSET, R S E T, yeah. and that really helped to close the loop. You know, to to uh, make inside and GNSS measurements um, comparable. Yeah, yeah, we've been co-locating GPS and RSETs. In Excellent. Global. That's that's very helpful. Yes. Thanks, Mike. Uh, do we have any other, any other questions? Gavin had a comment uh, that, uh, that I didn't get to that. I don't know if he's here, he want to discuss it more or, or we can discuss it offline. Uh, sure, we can discuss, that's fine, thanks. So uh, you, you suggest that tipping point um, or uh, generally imply some kind of multiple equilibria and or uh, histories while um, coastal flooding is not. I, I did not really talk about the coastal. Coastal flooding is the, the status of the system. So the system that I discussed is the vertical, the, the coastal land. So, and the, the parameter that in that tipping element act as a tipping, um, uh, has a tipping uh, point is the elevation of that land. So if that elevation you know, reaches a level that is very close to the sea level height, and a slight change in that result into rapid inundation. And that inundation is the consequence. So I'm not really arguing for the coastal flooding to be a tipping point or tipping element. It's a consequence of that tipping element reaching its tipping point. Yeah, so, I mean, but I mean, the graphs that you showed, showed a bifurcating multiple equilibria situation. And I'm struggling to see how that maps onto anything that you subsequently described. So the, the, the beginning was to make a case that the first few slides was to make a point that uh, vertical land motion has to be considered as a equally important parameter as the sea level rise itself. Oh, absolutely! No, no, that, that, I mean, there's no question. Uh, there's no question in my mind, and and the, the work that you've been doing uh, to quantify that, I, I think, is invaluable. Um, I, right. and, and perhaps that's more of a productive line of of, uh, of discussion. So, right. I, so, so let me let me ask a, another question since we're here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so on. before you showed Kevin, oh, before hi. Before you do that, I just wanted to comment that. If you create protective systems, then this tipping point point becomes really extraordinary. I mean, think of uh, Katrina and New Orleans, for instance. But I mean, we are talking here on New York City. A lot of uh, defense systems around Lower Manhattan, the Big U, and you name it. Boy, they are certainly subject to tipping points. Okay, so thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, you, you mentioned that, it's, that despite the fact that all of this data is available, uh, we don't actually have a global data set for vertical land motion at the right scales. Mm -hmm. So, so what's, what's really holding that back and how far do we have to go? I, I don't understand. You know, I tried that uh, to, to get that funding to get going. Uh, I, I, and I thought NASA would be the perfect place to do that because we created the expertise and probably we are one of the few, maybe not the only one, but probably one of the two groups can do that. And um, 
to my surprise, we didn't get enough support from NASA. So I don't understand this, the politic behind, because there is a politic. Definitely there is extreme need for that. But um, where I, I'm not playing the right politic, which I'm not good at, <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't answer that question because the need exists everywhere. I get demand for this kind of data literally every day from anywhere around the world, you can't imagine. So that they ask us, and I can't keep up with that. We don't have resources at university to do large scale processing. So this is really at, as large as we can go. You know, the, So that work that you see is a work of like three, four, uh, you know, one postdoc, two graduate students, and myself for almost a full year. And we used every computer we had, including some of the clusters and high performance computing, because it's hundred hundreds of terabytes of data to be handled. So I, I, I can't answer. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, um, I raised a concern to some of the NS NASA and NSF program managers that this, this is um, surprising that they don't support that kind of work, but I don't know why. I, I, I think they are, I mean, part of the uh, NASA sea level team folks, uh, Bill Hammond and, and, and others, uh, I think are doing something similar. Uh, but you're you're working together, or you're. Or the, I was on the team. Oh, exactly. I was actually on the team, and then uh, we created those, those maps for California, and then the, for next round that we put put in the proposal to continue that for the rest of the United States, the proposal didn't get funded. So, I I don't know, and I don't know anybody on the team that has this, this capability. We were the only team could do this kind of analysis. And I don't, I'm not aware of any similar product uh, on the team. Okay, interesting, thank you. Yeah, so if you find something, let me know. <laughs> um, thank you, Evan. Um, do we have any, uh, any, any further questions or comments? So when you're mapping this, um, how, what, what resolution are you, are you mapping? Are you multi, um, you know, down, basically downscaling the, the size? Right. So for, for the map that I showed you, resolution is 50 meters. 50. Okay. Each pixel is 50 meters. But um, we, we process also high resolution for structure. So we, we have, for example, demand or request to to process high resolution um, maps or data set for cities and infrastructures. So yeah. th for that, we go down to a resolution of 15 meters. Right, but it's harder to do a really large area is that resolution. Right. It's just a matter of computer, really. The, the algorithm yeah. and all the technologies exist, just we need computing yeah. facilities. So to get to, to go basically global. And in, in places like the, the forests and other vegetated areas, do you have problems of decorrelation? Yes. So the, 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 we use C-band, C-band signal does not penetrate yeah. into vegetation, but we are looking forward to this uh, next mission, NISAR, which is L-band. Yeah, would, right. that, will, uh, that will help. Yes, definitely. Um, I see. Uh, if I can, I still would like to ask a question. Yeah, please. Uh, Manu, uh, in your work for California, did it come up that the Great Valley beyond Sacramento is lower than some of the coastal areas mm -hmm. of the Great Bay. So that would be a most interesting tipping right. point once you exceed that yes. natural levee and you suddenly flood the Great Valley behind it. Right, right. I, I totally agree, yes. We, I'm, I'm actually thinking about that and I'm hoping to, you know, uh, do some work on that with some colleagues in California. Okay. Uh, thanks, Klaus. Uh, do we have any uh, final questions uh, from the group? Sometimes someone might be struggling to to uh, unmute. Are we coming up on on uh, Lunish here? Uh, 
and so I'm just uh, conscious that we should probably um, close off soon. Um, thanks ever, uh, 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 um, thank you so much again, uh, Manny, for, for uh, speaking to us this morning. It was a fascinating talk. I look very much forward to, to uploading this to, to, the, uh, to the YouTube channel. Um, if you'd like to uh, recommend any speakers from your group, perhaps, please let us know. It'd be wonderful. Um, thanks, everyone, again uh, uh, for joining us. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the day and, and, and also a, a great uh, Thanksgiving. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good day. Have Thanksgiving. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.